really, really precisely. And by selling a property, you can really test this electoral weak that has been in the 70s and really make sure that it works. So actually, by 1999, when this machine turned off, people knew, well, okay, you never know until you can find the thing, but people were really confident this electoral weak theory was wrong. And that the Higgs almost, the Higgs or something very like the Higgs had to exist because it was like, the whole thing doesn't work. It would be really weird if you could discover and these particles, they all behave exactly with the other television shit, but somehow this key piece of the picture in there is not there. So in a way, it depends how you look at it. The discovery of it is on its own um, is, is not a huge achievement in many, in both experiments and theoretically. On the other hand, it is like having a jigsaw puzzle where every piece has been filled in with this beautiful image and one gap and you kind of know that that piece must be there somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. So the discovery itself, although it's important, it is not so interesting. It's like a confirmation of the idea at, at that point. But what makes it interesting is not that it just completes the standard model, which is a theory that we have known had a basic layout box for 40 years or more now. Um, it's that the is actually is a, is a unique particle. It's very different to any of the other particles in the standard model. And it's a, a theoretically very Troublesome particle. There are a lot of nasty things to do with the Higgs, but also opportunities. Uh, so that we don't really understand how such an object can exist in the form that it does. So there are lots of reasons for thinking that the Higgs must come with a bunch of other particles, or that it's perhaps made of other things. So it's not a fundamental particle, but it's made of small things. I didn't talk about that if you like it, but that's still a notion. So, yeah. So the Higgs might not be a fundamental particle, but there might be some it might have all man. So that that is an idea. It's not, you know, it's not being demonstrated to be true, but I mean it's, it's all of these ideas basically come from the fact that um is a this is this is a problem that motivated a lot of development in physics in the last thirty years or so. And it's this basic fact that the Higgs field, which is this field that's everywhere in the universe, this is the thing that mass the particles. And the Higgs field is different from right? all the other fields in that Let's say you take the electromagnetic field, which is, you know, if we actually were to measure the electromagnetic field in this room, we would measure all kinds of stuff going on because there's lights, there's you know, microwaves and radio waves and stuff. But let's say we took a really, really remote part of empty space and shield it and put a big box around it and then measure the electromagnetic field in that box. Then the field would be almost zero, apart from some real quantum fluctuations, but basically it goes to naught. The Higgs field that has a value everywhere, so it's a bit like a whole is like, like the entire space has got this energy stored in the Higgs field, which is not zero, it's, it's finite. It's got something. It's like having the, the temperature of space raised to you know, some background temperature. Um, and it's that energy that gives mass to particles. So the reason that electrons and um, quarks have mass is through the interaction with this energy that's stored in the Higgs field. Now, it turns out that the precise value this energy has has to be very carefully tuned if you want the universe where interesting stuff can happen. So if you push the Higgs field down, it has a tendency to collapse to what? Well, if you do not the naive calculation, there are only two possible likely configurations for the Higgs field, which is either it's zero everywhere, in which case you have a universe which is just particles of no mass that can't form atoms and just fly out because it's light. Or it explodes to an enormous value, what we call the Planck scale, which is the scale of quantum gravity. And at that point, if the Higgs field was that strong, even an electron would become so massive that it would collapse into a black hole. And then you have a universe made of black holes and nothing like us. So it seems that the, the strength of the Higgs field is to, to achieve the value that we see requires what we call fine tuning, as the law of physics has to fiddle around with the other fields in the standard model and their properties to just get it to the right sort of Goldilocks value that allow that thing to exist. This is deeply fishy. People really dislike this. Well, yeah, I guess what so would be the two explanations. One, there's a God that designed it perfectly, and two is there's an infinite number of alternate universes, which just happen to be the one in which life is possible. Yeah. Complexity. So when you say uh, any life, any kind of complexity, that's not either complete chaos or black holes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, how does that make you feel? What do you make of that? That's such a fascinating notion of this perfectly tuned field that's the same everywhere. Yeah. It's there. What do you make of that? Yeah, what do you make of that? I mean, yeah, yeah, you may have to look for that maybe. Oh, really? Yeah, some well, yeah, I mean, as well. Some of them, yeah, some yeah. cognitive creators, like, yeah, let's fix that to be like, yeah, well, that's an impossibility, I guess. It's not a scientific impossible one, but, you know, theoretically, I guess, it's possible. It's very simple. Yeah. But there could also be, not a designer, but it could not be just, uh, I think it's, I'm not sure what that would be, but uh, some kind of force that, um, that, uh, some kind of mechanism by which this, this um, this kind of field is enforced in order to create complexity. It basically, it basically forces that um, pull the universe forward and interest in complexity. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't really subscribe to that. I'm saying it sounds really stupid. No, I, mean, I, I don't think people who make those kind of arguments. Um, you know, those ideas that I think it's the East Merlin's idea, for one of them, I think, that, you know, Universes are born inside black holes, and so universes, the big thing is about Darwinian evolution of the universe, where universes give birth to other universes, and the universes where black holes can form are more likely to give birth to more universes, so you end up with universes that have similar laws. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what it is. So I talked to, uh, I talked to Lee uh, recently on the podcast, and he's, uh, he's a reminder to me that uh, the physics community has, like, so many interesting characters. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, so, so I mean, as experimentalists, I tend to sort of think, I mean, very interesting ideas, but they're not really testable, so I tend not to think about them very much. So, I mean, going back to science with this, there, more than, there, there is an explanation, there is a possible solution to this problem, of it, which doesn't involve multiverses or creators fiddling about with the laws of physics. If the most popular solution is something called supersymmetry, which is a theory uh, which is involved, involves a new type of symmetry of the universe. In, in fact, it's one of the last types of symmetry that's possible to have that we haven't already seen in nature, which is a symmetry between force particles and matter particles. So what we call fermions, which are the force, the matter particles, and bosons, which are the force particles. And if you have supersymmetry, then there is a super partner for every particle in the standard model. And the, without going into detail, the effect of it basically is that you have a whole bunch of other fields. And these fields uh, cancel out the effect of the standard model fields, and they stabilize the Higgs field at a nice sensible value. So in supersymmetry, you naturally, without any tinkering about with the constants of nature or anything, you get a Higgs field with a nice value, uh, which is what we see. So this is one of the reasons, and supersymmetry is also God on things going for it. it predicts the existence of a dark matter particle, which would be great if, you know, it potentially suggests that the, the strong force and the electrical weak force do require high energy. But a lot of these people thought it was a productive idea. And when the OHC was just sort of turned on, there was a lot of hype, I guess, a lot of uh, expectation that we would discover these super partners, because and particularly the main reason was that if, if supersymmetry stabilizes the Higgs field at this nice Goldilocks value, these super particles should have a mass around the energy that we're probing at the other speed, around the energy of the Higgs. So it was kind of thought, this kind of Higgs, you probably discover two parts of the Higgs. Once you start creating ripples in the Higgs field, you should be able to see these kind of, uh, you should be, yeah, the mm-hmm. super fields will be there. Well, at the very beginning, say, we're probing the vacuum. What I mean is really is that, you know, let's say the super fields exist, the vacuum contains super fields, they're like these supersymmetric fields. We hit them hard enough, we can make them vibrate. We see super particles come flying out. That's the sort of stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. whole. Okay, that's the whole thing. Uh, but what do we have? What we have? So so far, at least, I mean, we've had now a decade of data taken at the OHC. Um, no signs of super particles have supersymmetric particles have been found. In fact, no signs of any physics, any particles don't stand well. So supersymmetry is not the only thing that can do this. There are other theories that involve additional dimensions of space or potentially involve the heat both on being made of smaller things and being made of other particles. So that's an interesting thing. I haven't heard that before. That's really that's an interesting thought. Do you think you lose on that? Like what uh, what could be what, what could the uh, Higgs particle be made of? Well so there's the oldest I think the original idea is about this was a theory called Technicolor, which were basically like an analogy with the strong force. So the idea was the Higgs boson 
was a bound state of two very strongly interacting particles that were a bit like quarks. So like quarks, but I guess higher energy things, with a super strong force, so not the strong force, but a new force that was very strong, and the Higgs was a bound state of, of these, these objects. And the Higgs in principle, if that was right, would be the first in a series of technicolor particles. Technicolor, I think, uh, not being a theorist, but it's, not, it's basically not done very well, specifically since the LAC found the Higgs, that kind of, it rules out, you know, a lot of these technicolor theories. But there are other things that are a bit like technicolor, so there's a theory called, um, partial compositeness, which is an idea that some of my colleagues at Cambridge have worked on, which is a, a similar sort of idea, that the Higgs is a, a bound state of some strongly interacting particles, and that the standard model particles themselves, the more exotic ones like the top quark, uh, are also sort of mixtures of these composite particles. So it's a kind of uh, an extension to the standard model, which explains this problem with the Higgs boson Goldilocks value. But also um, helps us understand we have we're in a situation now again a bit like the current table where we have six quarks, six electrons in this kind of great in this nice table and then you can see these columns where the patterns repeat and you go oh, okay maybe there's something deeper going on here you know and, and so this will potentially be something this partial composite of theory could explain a sort of enlarged picture that allows us to see a whole symmetrical pattern and understand what the ingredients. Why do we have these? One of the questions in the physics is why are there three copies of the matter particles? So, in what we call the first generation, which is what we're made of, there's the electron, uh, the electron neutrino, the up quark, and the down quark. They're the most common matter particles in the universe. Then there are copies of these four particles in the second and the third generation. So, things like neons and top quarks and other stuff. We don't know why. We see these patterns, we have no idea where it comes from. So. That's another the question, you know, can we find out the deeper order that explains this particular tape curve and the particles that we see? It is possible that the, uh, the deeper order includes like, almost a single entity, so it's something that I guess like strange theory dreams about. Mm -hmm. is, this, is, this, is, this, is this essentially the dream, if you discover something simple, beautiful, and unified? Yeah, I mean, that is the dream. And yeah, well, and I think it's for some people, for other people, it's an instant really. So there's a great book by uh, Stephen Weinberg, who is one of the theoretical physicists who was instrumental in building the standard model. So he came up with some others with the electrolyte theory, building the unified electrolyte mm -hmm. and the weak force. And he was the first, I think it was towards the end of the 80s and 90s, for Dreams of the Final Theory, which is a very lovely, quite short book about this idea of a final unifying theory that brings everything together. And I think you get the sense reading the book written at the end of the 80s and 90s that there was this feeling that such a theory was coming. Um, and that was the time when string theory had been, was, was very exciting. So string theory, there's been this thing called the super string revolution, and the theoretical physics became very excited. They discovered these theoretical objects, these little vibrating of the string, and in principle, not only was a quantum theory of gravity, but could explain all the particles of the standard model and bring it all together. And you, as you said, you have one object, the string, and you can pluck it, and the way it vibrates gives you these different notes, each of which is a different particle. So it's a very lovely idea. Um, but the problem is that, well, there's, there's a few people discovered that mathematics is very difficult. So people have spent three decades or more trying to understand string theory, and I think, you know, you, if you spoke to most drinkers, they would probably freely admit that no one really knows what drink theory is. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of work, but it's not really understood. And um, the other problem is that string theory mostly makes predictions about physics that occur at energies far beyond what we will ever be able to probe in the memory. Yeah, probably have that. By the way, so sorry, I have kids around here and tell us, uh, is there room for complete innovation of how to build particle collider that could give us an order of magnitude increase in, in the kind of energies, or do we need to keep just increasing the size of them? I mean, maybe, yeah, I mean, there are ideas, but that give you a sense of the gulf that has to be bridged. So, the LHC uh, collides particles at an energy of uh, what we call 14 tera electron volts. So that's basically the equivalent of the accelerator in a proton through 14 trillion volts. That gets us to the 
energy is where it keeps them be with particles that they're very massive. The, the scale where things is becoming manifest is something called Planck scale, which I think is of the order of 10 to the, uh, hang on, get this right, it's 10 to the 18 giga electron volts, so about 10 to the 15 um, tera electron volts. So you're talking, you know, trillions of times more energy. And more than the 10 to the 15 and 10 to the 14 larger. Uh, and then it's a very big number. Um, so, you know, we're not talking just an order of magnitude increase in energy, we're talking 14 orders of magnitude energy increase. So, to give you a sense of what that would look like, we need to build a particle accelerator with today's technology. Bigger or smaller than our solar system? It's about the size of the galaxy. The galaxy. So, you can have a particle accelerator that circles the Milky Way to, to get the energies where you see strings, if they exist. So, that is a fundamental problem, which is that most of the predictions of the unified, these unified theories, quantum theories of gravity, only make statements that are taxable at energies that we will not be able to probe. Um, and barring some unbelievable, you know, completely unexpected technological or scientific breakthrough, which is almost impossible to imagine. You never, you never say never, but it seems very unlikely. Yeah, uh, I can just see the news story. Elon Musk decides to build a <laughs> particle collider the size we have to be, we have to get together with all our galactic neighbors to, to pay for it. But what is the exciting possibility of the large Hadron Collider? What is there to be discovered in this in this order of magnitude scale? Mm -hmm. Is there other bigger efforts on the horizon in this space? What are, what are the open problems that are exciting possibility? You mentioned supersymmetry. Yeah. So well, there, there are lots of new ideas. There are lots of problems that we're facing. So if we come with a Higgs field, which Supersymmetry was supposed to solve. Um, there's the fact that 95% of the universe, we know from cosmology and astrophysics, is invisible, that it's made of dark matter and dark energy, which are really just words for things that we don't know what they are. For dollar dots are called an unknown. <laughs> we know we don't know what they are. Well, that's just that unknown, unknown, unknown. Yeah, well, they may be some unknown, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but uh, there's a whole bit of. Uh, particle um, accelerator could help us make sense of dark energy dark matter. There's still there's some hope for that. There's hope for that. Yeah, so there's one of the hopes that the LHC could produce a dark matter particle in its collision. And you know, it may be that uh, the LHC will still be selling new particles. So it might still super symmetry could still be there and just it's just maybe more difficult to, to find than we thought originally and, and you know dark matter particles might be being produced but we're just not looking in the right part of the data for them that that's possible. It might be we need more data, these photos are very rare and we need to collect a lot more data before we see them. But I think a lot of people would say now that um, the chances of the LHC don't the following is conversation with Mitra Kaku. He is a theoretical physicist, teacher, and professor at the City College of New York. He is the author of many fascinating books that explore the nature of our reality and the future of our civilization. They include Einstein's Cosmos, Physics of the Impossible, Future of the Mind, Parallel World, and his latest, The Future of Humanity, Terraforming Mars and their fellow travel, immortality, and our destiny beyond Earth. I think it's beautiful and important when a scientific mind can fearlessly explore through conversation subjects just outside of our understanding. That, to me, is what artificial intelligence is today, just outside of our understanding. A place we have to reach for, a place to uncover the mysteries of the human mind and build human level and superhuman level AI systems that transform our world for the better. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, give us five stars on iTunes, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Les Friedman, spelled F R I D M A N. And now, here's my conversation with me, Joe Kaku. You've mentioned that we just might make contact with aliens or at least hear from them within this century. Can you elaborate on your intuition behind that optimism? 
Well, this is pure speculation, of course. But given the fact that we've already identified 4,000 exoplanets orbiting other stars, and we have a census of the Milky Way galaxy for the first time, we know that on average, every single star, on average, has a planet going around it, and about one fifth or so of them have first size planets going around it. So just do the math. We're talking about out of 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, we're talking about billions of potential first size planets. And to believe that we're the only one is, I think, rather ridiculous, given the odds. And how many galaxies are there? Within sight of the Hubble Space Telescope, there are about 100 billion galaxies. So do the math. How many stars are there in the visible universe? 100 billion galaxies times 100 billion stars per galaxy. We're talking about a number beyond human imagination. And to believe that we're the only ones, I think, is, is rather ridiculous. So you talked about different types of uh, that zero, one, two, three, and five, even of the Kardashian scale um, of the different kinds of civilizations. What do you think it takes? If there is indeed a ridiculous notion that we're alone in the universe, what do you think it takes to reach out? First, to reach out to communication and connect. Well, first of all, we have to understand the level of sophistication of an alien life form if we make contact with them. I think in this century, we'll probably pick up signals. Signals from an extraterrestrial civilization will pick up their I love Lucy and their leaders of Eber. Uh, these ordinary day-to-day -day transmissions that uh, they emit. And the first thing we want to do is to A, decipher their language first, but B, figure out at what level they are advanced on the Kardashian scale. How much is it? We rank things by two parameters, energy and information. That's how we rank black holes, that's how we rank stars, that's how we rank civilizations in outer space. So, in fact, one civilization is capable of harnessing planetary power. They control the weather, for example. Earthquakes, volcanoes, they can modify the course of geological events. Sort of like Flash Gordon or Buck Rogers. <laughs> Type two would be stellar. They play with stars, entire stars. They use the entire energy output of the star, sort of like Star Trek. The Federation of Planets has colonized the nearby stars. So a type two would be so, somewhat similar to Star Trek. Type three would be galactic. They roam the galactic space plane. And type three would be like Star Wars a galactic civilization. So one day I was giving this talk in London as a planetarian there, and the little boy comes up to me and he says, Professor, you're wrong. You're wrong. This by four. And I told them, look this. There are planets, stars, and galaxies. That's it, folks. And he kept persisting and saying, no, this by four. The power of the continuum. And I thought about it for a moment. And I said to myself, is there an extra galactic source of energy, the continuum of Star Trek? And the answer is yes. There could be a type four. And that's dark energy. We now know that 73% of the energy of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter represents maybe 23% or so. And the real only represents 4%. We're the oddballs. And so it begins to realize that, yeah, they could be type 4, maybe even type 5. But type 4 is saying, being able to harness sort of like dark energy, something that permeates the entire universe. So be able to plug into the entire, entire universe and source of energy. So that's right. And dark energy is the energy of the Big Bang. It's why the galaxies are being pushed apart. It's the energy of nothing. The more nothing you have, the more dark energy that's impulsive. And so the acceleration of the universe is accelerating because the more you have, the more you can have. And that, of course, is by definition an exponential curve. It's called the Jupiter expansion, and that's the current state of the universe. And then type 5, would that be, would that be able to uh, 
think time disorder somehow outside of our universe. How that would be an idea. <laughs> yeah, how time fire will be the world reverse. Not uh, reverse. Uh, I'm a quantum physicist, and we quantum physicists don't believe that the Big Bang happened once. That's why they thought it's never been 30 principle. And that means that there could be multiple bangs happening all the time. Even as we speak today, universes are being created. And that's just the data. Uh, the inflationary universe is a quantum theory. So there's a certain finite probability that universes are being created all the time. And for me, this is actually rather aesthetically pleasing because, you know, I was raised as a vegetarian. So my parents uh, were Buddhists. And there's two diametrically opposed ideas about the universe. In Buddhism, there's only nirvana. There's no beginning, there's no end, there's only timelessness. But in Christianity, there is the instant when God said, let there be life. In other words, an instant of creation. So I've had these two mutually exclusive ideas in my head. And I now realize that it's possible to meld them into a single theory. Mm -hmm. Even the universe had a beginning or it didn't, right? Wrong. <laughs> you see, our universe had a beginning. Our universe had an instant where somebody might have said that there be life. But there's other bubble universes out there in a bubble bath of universes. And that means that these universes are expanding into a dimension beyond our three-dimensional comprehension. In other words, hyperspace. In other words, a leather dimensional hyperspace. So nirvana would be this timeless 11 dimensional hyperspace where big bangs are happening all the time. So we can now combine two mutually exclusive theories of creation. And Stephen Hawking, for example, even in his last book, even said that this is an argument against the existence of God. He said there is no God because there was not enough time for God to create the universe. If the big bang happened in an instant of time, therefore there was no time available for him to create the universe. But you see, the multiverse idea means that there was a time before time. And there are multiple times. Each bubble had its own time. And so it means that there could actually be a universe before the beginning of our universe. So if you think of a bubble bath, when two bubbles collide, well, when two bubbles sink into a big bubble, that's called the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is something but the collision of universes or the funny of universes. It's a beautiful picture of our incredibly mysterious existence. So is that humbling to you, exciting, the idea of multiverses? I don't even know how to you begin well, like, around my life. Around. Exactly for me, because what I do for a living is string theory. Uh, that's my day job. I get paid by the city of New York to work on string theory. Yeah. And you see, string theory is a multiverse theory. So people say, first of all, what is string theory? String theory simply says that all the particles we see in nature, the electrons, the protons, the force, what have you, and that means the vibrations on a Usable string, a tiny, tiny little string. You know, dear Robert Oppenheimer, the creator of the atomic bomb, was so frustrated in the 1950s with all these subatomic particles being created in our atom smashers that he announced, he announced one day that the Nobel Prize in physics to go to the physicists does not discover a new particle that year. Well, today we think there's nothing but musical notes on these tiny little vibrations. So what is physics? Physics is a harmony you can write on vibrating things. What is chemistry? Chemistry is a melody you can play on these strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of strings. And then what is the mind of God that Albert Einstein so eloquently wrote about for the last 30 years of his life? The mind of God was the cosmic music resonating to 11 dimensional practice from music play. What do you think is the mind of Einstein's God? Do you think there's a why that we can untangle from this, from this uh, universe string? Why are we here? What is the meaning of it all? Well, Stephen Weinberg, later than Nobel Prize, 
once said that the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn that it's pointless. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't profess to understand the great secrets of the universe. However, let me say two things about what the giants of physics have said about this question. Einstein believed in two types of gods. One was the god of the Bible, the personal god, the god that after his prayers walks on water from his miracle, like the Philippines. That's a personal god that he didn't believe in. He believed in the god of Spinoza, the god of order, simplicity, harmony, beauty. The universe could have been ugly. The universe could have been messy, random, but it's gorgeous. He relates on a single sheet of paper. We can write down all the known laws of the universe. It's amazing, on one sheet of paper, Einstein's equation is one inch long, string theory is a lot longer, and so is the standard model, but you can put all these equations on one sheet of paper. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been messy. And so Einstein finds himself as a young boy, entering this huge library for the first time, being overwhelmed by the simplicity, elegance, and beauty of this library, but all he could do was read the first page of the first song. Well, that library is the universe, with all sorts of mysterious and magical things that we have yet to find. And then Galileo was asked about this. Galileo said that the purpose of science the purpose of science is to determine how the heavens go. The purpose of religion is to determine how to go to heaven. So in other words, science is about natural law. And religion is about ethics. How to be a good person, how to go to heaven. As long as we keep these two things apart, we're in great shape. The problem occurs. When people from the natural sciences begin to pontificate about ethics, and people from religion begin to pontificate about natural law, that's where we get into big trouble. Do you think that fundamentally just think morality and ethics and our our idea of what is right and what is wrong? That's something that's outside the reach of Trinitarian theory and physics. That's right. If you talk to a squirrel about <laughs> what is right and what is wrong. There, there's no reference frame for a squirrel. And realize that the aliens from out of space and the other comes to visit us, they'll try to talk to us like we talk to squirrels in the forest, but eventually we get bored talking to the squirrels because they don't talk back to us. Same thing with the aliens from out of space. They come down to Earth, they'll be curious about us to the dream, but after a while they just get bored because we have nothing to offer them. So our sense of right and wrong what does that mean compared to a squirrel sense of right and wrong? Now we, of course, do have an ethic that keeps civilization in line, enriches our life, and makes civilization possible. And I think that's a good thing. But it's not mandated by a law of physics. So if aliens do, alien species work in any context, forgive me for uh, saying an alien for the moment, do you think they're more likely to be friendly to befriend us or to destroy us? Well, I think for the most part, uh, they'll pretty much ignore us. If you were dealing with the forest, who do you fear the most? Do you fear the hunter with the gigantic 15 uh, gauge shotgun? Or do you fear the guy with a briefcase and glasses? Well, the guy with the briefcase could be a developer. About to basically flatten the entire forest, destroying your livelihood. So instinctively, you may be afraid of the hunter. But actually, the problem with deers in the forest is they can fear developers. The developers look at deer as simply getting in the way. I mean, in War of the World by H.G. Wells, the aliens did not eat us. If you read the book, the aliens did not have evil intention towards the homo sapiens. No, we were in the way. So I think we have to realize that alien civilizations they do it quite differently than in science fiction novels. However, I personally believe, and I cannot prove anything, 
I personally believe that they're probably going to be peaceful because there's nothing that they want from our world. I mean, what are they going to take? What are they going to take us for? Gold? No. Gold is a useless metal for the most part. It's filled, I mean, it's gold, gold in color, but that only affects Homo sapiens. World don't care about gold. And so gold is a rather useless element. Rare earth, maybe. Platinum based elements, rare earth with electronics. Yeah, maybe. But other than that, we have nothing to offer them. I mean, you think about it for a moment. People love Shakespeare, and they love the art and poetry. But outside of the earth, they need nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, when I write down an equation in string theory, I would hope that on the other side of the galaxy, there's an alien writing down that very same equation in different notation. But that alien on the other side of the galaxy, Shakespeare, poetry, anyway, there would be nothing to him. Or her, or it. When you think about entities that's out there, extraterrestrial, do you think they would naturally look something that even is recognizable to us as an intellect? Or can, would they be radically different? Well, how did we become intelligent? Basically, three things made us intelligent. One is our eyesight, stereo eyesight. We have the eyes of a hunter, stereo vision, so we walk in on targets. And, and uh, who is smarter, predator or prey? Predators are smarter than prey. They have their eyes at the front of the face, like lions, tigers, wild rabbits. And lines to the side of their face. Why is that? Hunters have to zero in on the target. They have to know how to ambush. They have to know how to hide, camouflage, sneak up, stealth, deceit. That takes a lot of intelligence. Rapids, all they have to do is run. So that's the first criteria. Stereo eyesight of some sort. Second is the thumb. The opposable thumb of some sort could be a claw or a tentacle. So hand-eye coordination. Hand-eye coordination is the way we manipulate the environment. And then three, language. Because, you know, mama bear never tells baby bear to avoid this and under. Bears just order by themselves. They never hand out information from one generation to the next. So these are the three basic ingredients of intelligence. My side of some sort, an opposable thumb or tentacle or claw of some sort, and language. Now ask yourself a simple question. How many animals have all three? It's us. It's just us. I mean, the primates, they have a language. Yeah, they may get us to maybe 20 words, but a baby learns a word a day, several words a day a baby learns, and a typical adult knows about uh, almost 5,000 words. While the maximum number of words that you can teach a gorilla in any language, including their own language, is about 20 or so. And so we see the difference in intelligence. So when we meet aliens from outer space, chances are they will have been descended from predators of some sort, so have some way to manipulate the environment and communicate their knowledge to the next generation. That's it, folks. So functionally, that would that would be somewhere that would we would be able to recognize them. Well, not necessarily, because I think even with Homo sapiens, we are eventually going to perhaps uh, become part cybernetic and genetically enhanced. Already, uh, robots are getting smarter and smarter. Uh, right now, robots have the intelligence of a cockroach. But in the coming years, our robots will be as smart as a mouse. They may be as smart as a rabbit. If we're lucky, maybe as smart as a cat or a dog. And by the end of the century, we don't be sure, our robots will be probably as smart as a monkey. Now at that point, of course, they could be dangerous. You see, monkeys are self-aware. They know they are monkeys. They may have a different agenda than us. While dogs, dogs are confused. You see, dogs think that we are a dog. That we're the top dog. They're the underdogs. That's why they whisper and follow us and lick us all the time. We're the top dog. Monkeys have no illusion at all. 
they know we are not lucky. And so I think that you see people have to put a chip in their brain to shut them off once the robot have murder is done. But that's in a hundred years. In two hundred years, the robots will be smart enough to remove that still safe chip in their brain and then watch out. At that point, I think rather than compete with our robots, we should merge with them. We should become part of cybernetics. So I think moving the alien life on a space, they may be genetically and and uh, cybernetically enhanced. Genetically and cybernetically enhanced. Wow. So let's talk about that full range in the near term and the many years from now. How promising in the near term, in your view, is brain machine interface? So it's starting to allow computers to talk directly to the brain. You know, I'm left to work on that with Neuralink. And there's other companies working with this idea. Do you see promise there? Do you see hope for near term impact? Well, every technology has pluses and minuses. Uh, already, we can record memories. Uh, I have a book, The Future of the Mind, where I detail some of these breakthroughs. We can now record simple memories of mice and send these memories on the internet. Eventually, we're going to do this with primates at Wake Forest University and also in Los Angeles. And then after that, we'll have a memory share of Alzheimer's patients. We'll test it on Alzheimer's patients because, of course, when Alzheimer's patients lose their memory, they wander. They create all sorts of habits wandering around, uh, oblivious to their surroundings, and they'll have a chip. They'll push the button and memory. Memories will come flooding into the hippocampus and the chip, telling them where they live and who they are. And so memory chip is definitely in the cards. And I think this will eventually affect human civilization. What is the future of the internet? The future of the internet is brain net. Brain net is when we send emotions, feelings, sensations on the internet. And we will telepathically communicate with other humans this way. This is going to affect everything. Look at entertainment. Remember the silent movies? Charlie Chaplin was very famous during the era of silent movies, but when the talkies came in, nobody wanted to see Charlie Chaplin anymore because he never talked in the movie. And so a whole generation of actors lost their job, and a new series of actors came in. Next, we're going to have the movies replaced by brain death. Because in the future, people will say, who wants to see a screen with images? That's it, sound and image. That's called a movie. Yeah, all the entertainment industry, this multi-billion dollar industry is based on screens with moving images and sound. But what happens with emotions, feelings, sensations, memories can be conveyed on the internet? It's going to change everything. Human relations will change. We'll be able to empathize and feel the suffering of other people. We'll be able to communicate telepathically. And uh, this is this is coming. You described bringing that in the future of the mind. It's an interesting concept. Do you think uh, you mentioned entertainment? But what kind of effect would it have on our personal relationship? Hopefully, it will deepen it. You realize that for most of human history, for over ninety percent of human history, we only knew maybe twenty, a hundred people. That's it, folks. That was your tribe. That was everybody you knew in the universe was only maybe 50 or 100. With the coming of towns, of course it expands to 2,000, with the coming of telephones, all of a sudden you can reach thousands of people with cell phones. And now with the internet, you can reach the entire population of the planet Earth. And so I think this is a normal progression. And you, you think that kind of, sort of connection to the rest of the world and then adding sensations of being able to share so high with emotions and so on, that so would further deepen our connection to our fellow humans. Yes, right. In fact, I disagree with many scientists on this question. Most scientists would say that technology is neutral. A double-edged sword, one sword, one side of the sword can cut against people, the other side of the sword can cut against ignorance and disease. I disagree. I think technology does have a moral direction. 
Look at the internet. The internet spreads knowledge, awareness. And that creates empowerment. People act on knowledge. When they begin to realize that they don't have to live that way, they don't have to suffer under a dictatorship, that there are other ways of living under freedom, then they begin to take things, take power. And that spreads democracy. And democracies do not war with other democracies. I'm a scientist. I believe in data. So let's take a sheet of paper and write down every single war you had to learn since you were in elementary school. Every single war. Hundreds of them. Kings, queens, emperors, dictators. All these wars were between kings, queens, emperors, and dictators. Never between two major democracies. And why did with the spread of this technology and which will accelerate with the coming of brain net, it means that, well, we will still have wars, wars, of course, with politics by other means, but they'll be less intense and less frequent. Do you have worries from longer term existential risk from technology, from AI? So I think that's a wonderful vision of a future where war is a distant memory. But now there's another agent, there's, there's, there's somebody else that's able to create conflict, that's able to create harm, AI systems. Do you have to worry about this AI system? Well, yes, that is an existential risk, but again, I think an existential risk not for this century. I think our grandkids are going to have to confront this question as robots gradually approach the intelligence of a dog, a cat, and finally that of a monkey. However, I think we will digitize ourselves as well. Not only are we going to merge with our technology, we will also digitize our personality, our memories, our feelings. You realize that this, during the Middle Ages, there was something called dualism. Dualism meant that the soul was separate from the body. When the body died, the soul went to heaven. That's dualism. Then in the 20th century, neuroscience came in and said, God, come on. Every time we look at the brain, it says, Neuron. That's it, folks. Period. End of story. Bunch of neurons firing. Now we're going back to dualism. Now we realize that we can digitize human memories, feelings, sensations, and create a digital copy of ourselves. And that's called the Connecto Project. Billions of dollars are now being spent to do not just the genome project of people understanding the genes of the body. But the Connectome Project, which is to map the entire connections of the human brain. And even before then, already in Silicon Valley, today, at this very moment, you can contact Silicon Valley companies that are willing to digitize your relatives. <laughs> because some people want to talk to their parents. There are unresolved issues with their parents. And one day, yes, firms will digitize people, and you'll be able to talk to them a reasonable flexibility. We live, we leave a digital trail. Our ancestors did not. Our ancestors were lucky if they had one line, just one line in a church book, saying the date they were baptized and the date they died. That's it. That was their entire digital memory. I mean, their entire digital existence summarized in just a few letters of the alphabet. A whole life. Now, we digitize everything. We're going to see you digitize it. You put it on the internet. And so I think that we are going to digitize ourselves and give us digital immortality. We'll not only have biologic genetic immortality of some sort, but also digital immortality. Now, what are we going to do with it? I think we should send it into outer space. If we digitize the human brain and put it on a laser beam, and shoot it to the moon, you're on the moon in one second. Shoot it to Mars, you're on Mars in 20 minutes. Shoot it to Pluto, you're on Pluto in eight hours. Think about it for a moment. You can have breakfast in New York, and for a morning snack, vacation on the moon, then back the way to Mars by noon time, journey to the asteroid belt in the afternoon, and they come back to dinner in New York at night. <laughs> All your day's work at the speed of light. Now, this means that you don't need booster rockets, you don't need weightlifting problems, you don't need to worry about meteorites. Now, what's on the moon? 
On the moon, there is a mainframe that downloads the laser beam information. Now, where do you download the information into? An avatar. So, what does an avatar look like? Anything you want. Think about it for a moment. You could be Superman, Superwoman, on the moon, on Mars, traveling throughout the universe at the speed of light, downloading your personality into any vehicle you want. Now, let me stick my neck out. So far, everything I've been saying is well within the laws of physics. Well within the laws of physics. Now, let me go outside the laws of physics. There we go. I think this already exists. I think outside the Earth, there could be a super highway, a laser highway, a laser pointing with billions of souls of aliens exactly their way across the galaxy. Now, let me ask you a question. Are we smart enough to determine whether such a thing exists or not. No, this could exist right outside the orbit of the planet Earth, and we're too stupid in our technology to either prove it or disprove it. We would need the aliens on this laser superhighway to help us out, <laughs> to, to send us a uh, human interpretable signal. I mean, it ultimately goes down to the language of communication. That's an exciting possibility that actually the sky is still. <laughs> the aliens still already be here, and we're just so oblivious that we're too stupid to know. See, we don't have to be in alien form with, with a little green man. They could be in any form they want, in an avatar of their creation. Or, in fact, they could very well be. They uh, don't know what that does. Exactly. You never know. Well, one of us could be. You know, with the zoo, did you know that we, we sometimes have zoo teachers and everyday animals? We create a fake animal and we put it in so that the animal is not uh, afraid of this fake animal. And of course, the animal's brain, the brain is about as big as a walnut. They accept these dummies as if they were real. So an alien civilization out of space would say, oh yeah, human brains are so tiny, we could put a dummy out of their world, an avatar, and they never know. That would be an entertaining thing to watch from the alien perspective. So you can kind of imply that with a, with a digital form of our being, but also biologically. Do you think one day technology will allow individual human beings to become immortal besides just through the ability to digitize our essence? Yeah, I think that artificial intelligence will give us the key to, to genetic immortality. You see, in the coming decades, everyone's going to have their gene sequence. We'll have billions of genomes of old people, billions of genomes of young people. And what are we going to do with it? We're going to run into an AI machine, which has higher mechanism, to look for the age gene. In other words, the fountain of youth that emperors, kings, and queens lusted after over, the fountain of youth will be found by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will identify where these Age genes are located. First of all, what is aging? We now know what aging is. Aging is the buildup of errors. That's all aging is. The buildup of genetic errors. This means that cells eventually become slower, sluggish, and we want to senescence, and they die. In fact, that's why we die. We die because of the buildup of the state in our genome, in our cellular activity. But you see, in the future, we'll be able to fix those genes with CRISPR-type technology, and perhaps even live forever. So let me ask you a question. Where does aging take place in a car? Given a car, where does aging take place? Well, it's obvious. The engine, right? A, that's where you have a lot of moving parts. B, that's where you have combustion. Well, where in the cell do we have combustion? The mitochondria. Study psychology online, designed by those who change it. That's what I have learned today. Mitochondria. We now know where aging takes place. And if we cure many of the mistakes that build up in the mitochondria itself, we could become immortal. Let me ask you, if you yourself could become immortal, would you? Damn straight. <laughs> no, I think about it for a while because, of course, it, determines, it depends on how you become immortal. 
You know, there's a famous myth of Tiffany. It turns out that years ago, in the Greek mythology, there was the saga of Tiffany and Aurora. Aurora was the goddess of the dawn, and she fell in love with a mortal, a human called Tiffany. And so Aurora begged, begged Zeus to grant her the, the gift of immortality to give to her lover. So Zeus took pity on Aurora and made Tiffany immortal. But you see, Aurora made a mistake, a huge mistake. She asked for immortality, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth. So poor Tiffany got older and older and older every year, decrepit, a bag of bones, but he could never die. Never die. Audio less important. <laughs> So I think immortality is a great idea as long as you also have a moral use as well. Now I personally believe, and I cannot prove this, but I personally believe that our grandkids may have the option of reaching the age of 30 and then stopping. They may like being age 30 because they have wisdom, they have all the benefits of age and maturity, and they still live forever with a healthy body. Our descendants may like being carried for several centuries. Is there an aspect of human existence that is meaningful only because we're mortal? Well, every waking moment, we don't think about it this way, but every waking moment, actually, we are aware of our death and our mortality. Think about it for a moment. When you go to college, you realize that you are in a period of time where soon you will reach middle age and have a career. And after that, you'll retire, and then you'll die. And so even as a youth, even as a child, without even thinking about it, you are aware of your own death. It is set limits to your lifespan. I got to graduate from high school. I got to graduate from college. Why? Because you're going to die. Because unless you graduate from high school, unless you graduate from college, you're not going to enter old age with enough money to retire and then die. And so, yeah, people think about it unconsciously because it affects every aspect of your being. The fact that you go to high school, college, get married, have kids, it's a cost. A cost to gain even without your permission. It gives a sense of urgency. Do you, do you yourself, I mean, there's so much excitement and passion in the way you talk about business and we talk about technology in the future. Do you yourself meditate on your own mortality? Do you think about this clock that's ticking? Well, I try not to because it then begins to affect your behavior. You begin to alter your behavior to match your expectation of, of when you're going to die. So let's talk about youth and then let's talk about death, okay? When I interview scientists on radio, I often ask them, what made the difference? How old were you? What changed your life? And they always say more or less the same thing. You know, these are Nobel Prize winners, directors of major laboratories, very distinguished scientists. They always say, when I was 10, when I was 10, something happened. It was a visit to the planetarium with a telescope for Stephen Weinberg, and there was a Nobel Prize. It was a chemistry kit. For Heinz Fagel, it was a visit to the planetarium. For Isidore Rabi, it was a, a book like a planet. For Albert Einstein, it was a compass. Something happened which gives them this existential shock. You see, before the age of 10, everything is mommy and daddy, mommy and daddy. That's your universe, mommy and daddy. Around the age of 10, you begin to wonder, what's beyond mommy and daddy? And that's when you have this epiphany. When you realize, oh my God, there's a universe out there. A universe of discovery. That sensation stays with you for the rest of your life. You still remember that shock that you felt gazing at the universe. And then you hit the greatest destroyer of scientists known to science. The greatest destroyer of scientists known to science is junior high school. <laughs> when you hit junior high school, folks, it's all over. Yeah. It's all over. Because in junior high school, people say, hey, stupid, I mean, you like that dirty stuff, and your friends shun you, all of a sudden, these people think you're a weirdo, and scientists make 
boring. You know, Richard Feynman did a little part of when he was a child. His father would take him into the forest. And the father would teach him everything about birds. Why do they shape the way they are? Their wings, the coloration, the shape of their feet. Everything about birds. So one day a boy comes up to the Peace and Nobel Prize winner and says, Hey Dick, what's the name of that bird over there? Well, he didn't know. He knew everything about that bird except its name. So he said, I don't know. And then the boy said, what's the matter, Dick? You stupid or something? And then in that instant, he got it. He got it. He realized that for most people, science is giving names to birds. That's what science is. You know, lots of names of obscure things. Hey, people say, you're smart. You're smart. You know all the names of the dinosaurs. You know all the names of the plants. No. That's not science at all. Science is about principles, concepts, physical pictures. That's what science is all about. My favorite quote from Einstein is that unless you can explain the theory to a child, the theory is probably worthless. <laughs> Meaning that all great theories are not big words. All great theories are simple concepts, principles, basic physical pictures. Uh, relativity is all about clock, meter sticks, rocket ships, and locomotives. Newton's laws of gravity are all about balls and spinning wheels and things like that. That's what physics and science is all about, not memorizing things. And that stays with you for the rest of your life. So even in old age, I've noticed that you find it when they sit back, they still remember. They still remember that flush that flood of excitement they felt with that first telescope, that first moment when they encountered the universe. That keeps them going. That keeps them going. By the way, I just point out that when I was eight, something happened to me as well. Yeah. When I was eight years old, it was in all the papers that a great scientist had just died, and they put a picture of his death on the front page. That's it, just a simple picture on the front page of the newspapers of his death. That death had a book on it which was open. And the caption said, more or less, this is the unhinged manuscript from the greatest scientist of our time. So I said to myself, well, why couldn't you finish it? What's so hard that you can't finish it if you're a great scientist? It's a homework problem, right? You go home, you solve it. Or you ask your mom, why couldn't you solve it? So to me, this was a murder mystery. This is greater than any invention story. I had to know why the greatest scientists of our time couldn't finish something. And then over the years, I found out the guy had a name, Albert Einstein, and that book was the theory of everything. It was unfinished. Well, today, I can read that book. I can see all the dead ends and false starts that he made and begin to realize that he lost his way because he didn't have a physical picture to guide him on the third try. On the first try, he talked about clocks and lightning bolts and meter sticks, and then he was special relativity, which gave us the atomic bomb. The second great picture was gravity with balls rolling on closed surfaces. And that gave us the Big Bang, creation of the universe, black hole. On the third try, he missed it. He had no picture at all to guide him. In fact, it's a quote I have where he said, I'm still looking. I'm still looking for that picture. He never found it. Well, today we think that picture is string theory. The string theory can unify gravity and this mysterious thing that I decided didn't want to push a quantum mechanics, so couldn't couldn't quite sit down on these kind of That's right. Mother Nature has two hands, the left hand and the right hand. The left hand is the theory of the small, the right hand is the theory of the big. The theory of the small is the quantum theory, the theory of atoms and quarks. The theory of the big is relativity, the theory of black holes, big bangs. The problem is the left hand does not talk to the right hand. They hate each other. 
The left hand is based on discrete particles. The right hand is based on smooth, smooth surfaces. How do you put these two things together into a single theory? They hate each other. The greatest minds of our time, the greatest minds of our time, work on this problem and fail. Today, the only one, the only theory that has survived every challenge so far is string theory. That doesn't mean string theory is correct. It could very well be wrong. But right now, it's the only game in town. Some people come up to me and say, Professor, I don't believe in string theory. Give me an alternative. And I tell them, there is none. Get used to it. <laughs> it's the best. Graduate with a degree and a skill with what is one. Explore, inquire, apply. The best theory we got is the only theory we have. It's the only theory you have. Do you see, you know, the strings kind of inspire a view as did atoms and particles and quarks, but especially the strings inspire a view of the universe as, as a kind of information processing system as a, as a computer of the sort. Do you see the universe in this way? No. Some people think, in fact, the whole universe is a computer of some sort, yeah. and they believe that perhaps everything therefore is a simulation. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think that there is a super video game where we are nothing but puppets dancing on the screen, and somebody gets a play button, and here we are talking about simulation. Yeah. No. Even Newtonian mechanics says that the weather, the simple weather, is so complicated with trillions upon trillions of atoms that it cannot be simulated in a finite amount of time. In other words, the smallest object which can describe the weather and simulate the weather is the weather itself. The smallest object that can simulate a human is the human itself. And if you had quantum mechanics, it becomes almost impossible to simulate it with a conventional computer. The quantum mechanics deals with all possible universes, parallel universes, a multiverse of universes. And so the calculation just spirals out of control. Now, there, at some point, there's only one way where you might be able to argue that the universe is a simulation. And this is still being debated by quantum physicists. It turns out that if you throw the encyclopedia into a black hole, the information is not lost. Eventually, it winds up on the surface of the black hole. Now, the surface of the black hole is finite. In fact, you can calculate the maximum amount of information you can store in a black hole. It's a finite number. It's a possible number, believe it or not. Now, if the universe is made out of black holes, which is the maximum universe you can conceive of, each universe, each black hole, has a finite amount of information. Therefore, ergo, da -da, ergo, the total amount of information in a universe is finite. This is mind-boggling. This, I consider mind-boggling. That all possible universes are countable. And all possible universes can be summarized in a number. A number you could write on a sheet of paper. All possible universes. And it's a finite number. Now, it's huge. It's, it's a number beyond human imagination. It's a number based on what is called a point But it's a number. And so, if a computer can ever simulate that number, then it would, the universe would be a simulation. So, theoretically, because of, uh, because of the amount of information finite, there, well, there necessarily must be able to exist a computer. It just, from an engineering perspective, may be possible to build. <laughs> yes, so, well, no computer can build a universe capable of simulating the entire universe, except the universe itself. So, that's your intuition, I think that our universe is very efficient, and so there's no shortcut. Right, two, two reasons why I believe the universe is not a simulation. First is the calculational number is just incredible. No finite uh, current machine can simulate the universe. And second, why would any super intelligent being simulate humans? I mean, if you think about it, most humans are kind of stupid. I mean, we do all sorts of crazy stupid things, right? And we call it art. We call it humor. We call it human civilization. So why should an advanced civilization go through all that effort just to simulate 
That's why we have no sun. But you see, the waste product of a fusion reactor is helium gas. Helium gas is actually commercially valuable. You can make money selling helium gas. And so the waste product of a fusion reactor is helium, not nuclear waste that we find in a commercial fission plant. And that controlling, matching controlling fusion allows us to uh, convert this into type 1, I guess, civilization, right? Uh, yeah, probably the best one of the type 1 civilization will be uh, fusion power. We, by the way, are type 0. We don't have to rate on the scale to get an energy from this plant, for God's sake, or whatever it's called. But we are about 100 years of being type 1. You know, get a calculator. In fact, Carl Sagan calculated that we are about 0.7, uh, fairly close to a 1.0. For example, uh, what is the internet? The internet is the beginning of the first type 1 technology to enter into our century. The first planetary technology is the internet. What is the language of type 1? On the internet already, English and Mandarin Chinese are the most dominant languages on the internet. And uh, what about the culture? We're seeing a type 1 sport, soccer, uh, the district, a type 1 music, a new culture, rock and roll, rap music, type 1 fashion, Gucci, Chanel, a type 1 economy, the European Union, NAFTA, what have you. So we're beginning to see the, the beginning of a type 1 culture and a type 1 civilization. And inevitably, it will spread beyond this planet. The, it, 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 what you see is what you get. Not after it's your profits. You, you talked about sending a 20% of the speed of light on a chip in Delta Centauri. But in a slightly nearer term, what do you think about the idea when we still have to send biological our biological body the colonization planet, colonization of Mars? Do you see us becoming a two planet species ever or any time soon? Well, just remember the dinosaurs did not have a space program. Now, that's why we're not here today. How come there are no dinosaurs in this room today? Uh, because they didn't have a space program. We do have a space program, which means that we have an insurance policy. Now, I don't think we should bankrupt the Earth or deplete the Earth to go to Mars. That's too expensive and not practical. But we need a settlement. A settlement on Mars in case something bad happens to the planet Earth. And that means we have to terraform Mars. Now, to terraform Mars, if we could raise the temperature of Mars by six degrees, six degrees, then the polar ice caps begin to melt, releasing water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. It causes even more melt in the ice cap. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It feeds on itself. It uh, becomes autocatalytic. And so once you hit 6 degrees, well, rising of the temperature on Mars at 6 degrees, it takes off. And we melt the polar ice caps, and liquid water, once again, flows in the rivers, the canals, the channels, and the ocean of Mars. Mars once had an ocean, we think, about the size of the United States. And so that is a possibility. Now, how do we get there? How do we raise the temperature of Mars by 6 degrees? Elon Musk would like to get a hydrogen warhead on the polar ice cap. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure about that. Uh, because we don't know that much about the effect of detonating hydrogen warheads to go on the yeah? And who wants to blow in the dark at night reading a newspaper? <laughs> so I think there are other ways to do it, with solar sort of satellites. You can have satellites orbiting Mars that beam sunlight onto the polarized gas, melting the polarized gas. Mars has plenty of water. It's just frozen. I think you uh, think inspiring and a wonderful picture of the future. It's, uh, I mean, you've inspired and uh, educated thousands, if not millions. Thank you, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for talking today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
several civilizations have a planet uh, the size of the Earth, roughly at the same distance as the Earth is from the Sun. And that means that they can have liquid water on their surface and the chemistry of life is in order. So if you roll the dice billions of times, just within the Milky Way galaxy, and then you have tens of trillions of galaxies like it within the observable volume of the universe, it would be extremely arrogant to think that we're special. I don't think that we're so middle of the road, typical forms of that. And that's why then nobody pays attention to us. You know, if you go down the street on the sidewalk and you see an ant, you don't pay attention or a special respect to that ant, you just continue to walk. And so I think that we are sort of average, not very interesting, not exciting. Nobody cares about us. We tend to think that we're special, but that's a sign of immaturity and we're very early on in life development. Yes, that's another thing that we have our technology only for a hundred years and it's evolving exponentially right now on a three year time scale. So imagine what would happen in a hundred years, in a thousand years, in a million years or in a billion. Now the sun is actually relatively late in the star formation history of the universe. Most of the sunlight stars form earlier. And some of them already died and they became white walls. And so uh, if you imagine that a civilization like ours existed around a typical sunlight like star, by now, if they survive, they could be a billion years old. And then imagine a billion year technology. It would look like magic to us. It's you know, an approximation to God. We wouldn't be able to understand it. Uh, and so in my view, we should be humble. And by the way, we should probably just listen and not speak. Because <laughs> There is a risk, right? If, if, if you are inferior, there is a risk. If you speak too loudly, uh, something bad may happen to you. If you mentioned uh, we should be humble also in the sense the analogy to Anne, that uh, they might be better than us. So there's a kind of scale that we're talking about. And in a, in a question, you mentioned the word sentient. So sentient, or maybe the more basic formulation of that is consciousness. Do you think, um, do you think that this thing within our humans in terms of this typical life form of consciousness is the essential element that permeates other, if, if there's other alien civilizations out there that they have something like consciousness as well? Or is this, I guess I'm asking, can you try to untangle the word attention? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Uh, I think what is most abundant depending on how long we survive. So if you look at us as an example, uh, we are now, we do have conscious and we do have technology, but the technologies that we are developing are also means for our own destruction, as we can tell. You know, we can change the climate if we are not careful enough. Uh, we can go into nuclear war. So we are developing means for our own destruction through self-inflicted wounds. And it might well be that creatures like us are not long-lived, that the crocodiles on other planets live for billions of years. They don't destroy themselves, they live naturally. And so if you look around, the most common thing would be dumb animals that live for long times, you know, not those that have conscious. But in terms of changing the environment, I think since I mean, humans develop tools, they get, develop uh, the ability to construct technologies that would lift us from this planet that we were born in. And that's something animals without a consciousness uh, cannot really do. And, and so, I, you know, in terms of uh, looking for things that, are, that, that went beyond the circumstances they were born into, I would think that even if they are short-lived, these are the creatures that made the biggest difference to their environment, and we can search for them. You know, even if they are short-lived, and most of the civilizations are dead by now. Yeah. Even if that's the best fact to think about, by the way. Well, but if you look on Earth, that's, you know, there are also cultures that exist throughout time and they are dead by now. The Mayan culture was very sophisticated, died, but we can find evidence for it and learn about it just by archaeology, digging into the ground, looking. And so we can do the same thing in space. Look for dead civilizations, and uh, perhaps we can learn a lesson. 
why they die, and behave better so that we will not share the same fate. So I think, you know, there is a lesson to be learned from the sky. And by the way, I should also say, if we find a technology that we have not dreamed of, that we can import to Earth, that may be a better strategy for making a fortune than going to Silicon Valley or going to Wall Street. <laughs> yes. Because you would actually make a jump start into something of the future. So that's one way to do the leap is actually to find the literally discover versus come up with the idea uh, in our limited human capacity, the current common capacity. We could look at it and feel like cheating in an exam where you look over the shoulder of the student next to you. Yeah. But it's not good on an exam, but it's, it is good when you're coming up with technology that can change the, the fact that it's human civilization. But there is, uh, you know, in my neck of the woods in artificial intelligence, there's a lot of trajectories you want to imagine of creating very powerful beings, uh, the, the technology that's essentially, you know, you can call super intelligence that could achieve space exploration, all those kinds of things without consciousness, right. without something that to us even looks like consciousness. And there, you know, there is a sad feeling I have that consciousness too, in terms of us being humble, is a thing we humans take too seriously. That is, we think it's special just because we have it. But it could be a thing that's actually holding us back in some kind of way. It would be. So it would be. Uh, I should say something about AI because I do think it offers a very important uh, uh, step into the future. Uh, if you look at the Old Testament, the Bible, there is this story about Noah, Ark, that we might know about. Yeah. Noah, uh, knew about a great flood that is about to endanger all life on earth. So he decided to build an ark. And the Bible actually talks about specifically what the, the size of this ark was, what the dimensions were. That's how it was quite similar to who or more that we will discuss in a few minutes. But uh, at any event, he built this ark and he put animals on it so that they were safe from the great flood. Now, you can think about doing the same on earth because there are risks for future catastrophes. You know, we could have the self inflicted wounds that we were talking about, like nuclear war, changing the climate, or there could be an asteroid impacting us, just like the dinosaurs died. You know, the, the dinosaurs didn't have science, astronomy, they could have a warning system, but there was this big stone, big rock that approached yeah. it. The, it must have been a beautiful sight, yeah. just when it was approaching that very big and then smashed them. Okay, yeah. and kill them. So, uh, you could have a catastrophe like that, or in a bigger year, the sun will basically boil off all the ocean on Earth. And then, uh, uh, currently all our eggs are in one basket, but we can spread them. It's sort of like uh, the printing press, if you think about it. The revolution that Gutenberg brought is there were very few copies of the Bible at the time, and each of them was precious because it was handwritten. But once the printing press produced multiple copies, you know, if something bad happened to one of the copies, it wasn't a catastrophe, you know, it wasn't a disaster, because you had many more copies. That, and so, if we have copies of life here on Earth elsewhere, then we avoid the risk of it being eliminated by a single point breakdown, catastrophe. So, the question is, can we build not spaceships that will carry life as you know? Now, you might think we have to put elephants and whales and birds on a big spaceship, but that's not true, because all you need to know is the DNA making, the genetic making of these animals, put it on a computer system that has AI plus a 3D printer, so that this CubeSat, which is rather small, yes, can go with this information to another planet and use the raw materials there to produce synthetic life. And uh, that would be a way of producing coffee, just like the Gutenberg printing press. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be exact copies of the humans that you just contain some big elements of life and then have enough life on board that it could uh, reproduce the process of evolution on another place. Right. So I mean, that's also makes it sad, of course, because it uh, you could talk the mortality of your own little precious consciousness and all your own memories and all your own stuff. But who cares? 
mind, right? You can buy yours. No, no, I actually don't. You know, when you look at the big, if you're an astronomer, one thing that you learn from the universe yeah. is to be modest. So you're not so significant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. think about it. All these emperors and kings that conquered a piece of land on Earth and were extremely proud. You know, you see these images uh, of the kings and emperors that you know, usually are alpha male, and uh, they spend, you know, strong and um, they are very proud of themselves. But if you think about it, they are 10 to the power of 20. Planets like the Earth, the observable volume of the universe. And this view of conquering a piece of planet, even conquering all of Earth, is just like an ant having a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. That's not very impressive. So you can't be out of that. If you see the big picture, you have to be humble. You know, also we, we are short lived. You know, we, within a hundred years, that's it. Right? So what does it mean? First, to be humble, modest. You never have significant power to add into the big scheme of things. And second, you should appreciate every day that you live yeah. and, and learn about the world. Humble and so grateful. Yes, exactly. Well, let's uh, talk about uh, probably the most interesting object I've heard about and also the most fun to pronounce. Amor Moa. Yes, Amor Moa. Can you tell me the story? Of uh, this object and why it may be an important event in human history, and is it possibly a piece of alien technology? Right, so uh, this is the first object that was spotted close to Earth from outside the solar system, and it was found in, on October 19, 2017. And at that time, it was receding away from us. Uh, and at first, Astronomers so thought it must be a piece of rock, you know, just like all the asteroids and comets that we have seen from within the solar system. And it just came from another star. I should say that the actual discovery of this object was surprising to me because a decade earlier, I wrote the first paper together with Ed Turner and Amaya Moro Martin that tried to predict whether the same telescope that was serving the sky, ANSA, from Hawaii, would find anything from interstellar space, given what we know about the solar system. So if you assume that other planetary systems have similar abundance of rocks and you just calculate how many should be ejected into interstellar space, the conclusion is, no, uh, it, we shouldn't find anything with Panther. To me, I apologize, it's not going to reveal my stupidity, but it was surprising to me that so few interstellar objects from outside the solar system have ever been detected. Or no, none. 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 Yes. And you, you do well, maybe talk about it, that there has been uh, uh, one or two rocks since then. Well, since then there was one uh, called the Boriso. It was discovered by an amateur Russian astronomer, yeah. uh, Gennady Boriso. And uh, that one looks like a comet. Yeah. And uh, just like a comet from within the solar system. But this is a really important point, sorry to interrupt that. Uh -huh. you, you showed that it's unlikely that a rock from another solar system would uh, arrive to our Earth. Right. And so the actual detection of this one was surprising by itself yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, and then, and, but then, so at first they thought maybe they could be the comet or an asteroid, but then it, looked, it didn't look like anything we've seen before. Boriso did look like a, a comet. So people asked me afterwards and said, you know, doesn't it convince us if Boriso looks like a comet? Doesn't it convince you that more and more is also natural? Yeah. And I said, you know, when I went on the first date with my wife, uh, she looked special to me. Yeah. And since then, I met many women. Yeah. That didn't change my opinion. Yeah. My yeah. Life. Yeah. So it, you know, that's not an argument. But anyway, so why did <laughs> why did the uh, more and more look weird? Yeah. Let me explain. So first of all, I found that money for the amount of light, sunlight, that it reflects. Yeah. And uh, it was tumbling, spinning, every eight hours. And then it was spinning the brightness that we saw from that direction. We could resolve this so it's tiny, about a hundred meters, a few hundred feet, size of the field. And uh, we cannot compare it with, with existing telescopes. We cannot resolve it. The only way to actually get a photograph of it is set the camera close to it. That was not possible at the time 
that the uh, world war was discovered because it was already moving away from us faster than any rocket at the time. It's not like a guest that appears for dinner, and then by the time we realize that it's weird, uh, the guest is already out the front door into the dark street. Yeah. What we would like to find is an object like it approaching us, because then you can send the camera irrespective of how fast it moves. And uh, if we were to find it in July 2017, that would have been possible, because it was approaching us at that time. Actually, I was visiting Mount Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii, with my family for vacation at that time, in July 2017. But nobody knew uh, at the observatory that the Umuamua is very slow. Let's try to think about the way I have to say that I yes, the set up a camera. But don't worry, I mean, if there will be more. There will be more because, you know, I, I operate by the Copernican principle, which says we don't live at a special place and we don't live at a special time. And that means, you know, if we survey the sky for a few years and we had sensitivity to this region between us and the sun, and we found this object with suns up, you know, there should be many more that we will find in the future with surveys that might be even better. Yeah. Uh, and actually, in three years' time scale, there would be and the so-called LSSP, that's a survey of the Vera Rubin Observatory, that would be much more sensitive and could potentially find an more like object every month. Yeah. Okay, so well, I'm just waiting for that. And the main reason for me to alert everyone uh, to the unusual properties of Umuamua is with the hope that next time around when we see something that is unusual, we will take a photograph or we will get as much evidence as possible. Because science is based on evidence, not on prejudice. And we will get back to that thing. So anyway, let me let me point out what the property is actually. Yeah, yeah. the object, nature, all that kind of thing. So uh, the light, uh, the, the amount of light, sunlight that was reflected from it was changing over eight hours by a factor of ten. Meaning that the area of this object, even though we can't resolve it, the area on the sky that reflects sunlight was bigger by a factor of 10 in some phases as it was tumbling around than in other phases. So even if you take a piece of paper that is raised with 10, you know, there is a very small likelihood that it's exactly as wrong. Uh, and getting a factor of 10 change in the area that you see on the sky is huge. It's much more than any other. It means that the object has an unusual geometry. And it's at least a factor of a few more than any of the comets or asteroids that we have seen before. The new dimensional activity is not just the geometry, but the, the properties of the surface of that thing. Well, uh, or no. If you assume the repetitivity is the same, okay. then it's just geometry. If you assume the repetitivity may change, yes. then it could be a combination of the area that you see and the repetitivity, because different directions may reflect differently. But the point is that it's very extreme. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, actually the best fit to the light curve that we saw was of a flat object, unlike all the cartoons that you have seen of a cigar shape. Uh, a flat object at the 90% confidence gives a better model for the way that the light varies. Yeah. And uh, it's it works quite mean, like a pancake. Like a pancake, yeah. exactly. Uh, and uh, so that's you know, the very first uh, unusual property. But to me, it was not unusual enough to think that it might be artificial. It was not significant. Then uh, there was no commentary you know, No dust, no gas around the, this object. And the Steeple Space Telescope really searched very deeply for carbon based molecules. There was nothing. So it's definitely not a comet the way people expected it to be. Can you maybe briefly mention what uh, probably the comet that you are currently usually has? Right. So a comet is a rock that has some water ice on the surface. So you can think of it as an icy rock. Um, actually, comets were discovered a long time ago, but uh, the first model uh, that was uh, developed for, for them was by Fred De Wittel, who was at Harvard. And uh, I think the legend goes that he got the idea from walking to how a square and seeing uh, uh, during a winter day and uh, seeing these icy rocks, you know, and so a comet is icy and the ice on is uh it's not not a rock. It's just a rock. Yeah. So when you have ice on the surface, when the rock gets close to the sun, the sun
sound like one guitar. And uh, the ice suddenly evaporates. Because what, the one thing about ice, water ice, is it doesn't become liquid if you warm it up in vacuum, you know, without an external pressure. And it just goes straight into gas. And that's what you see as the tail of the comet. Uh, the only way to get liquid water is to have an atmosphere like on Earth that has an external pressure. Only then you get liquid. And that's why it's essential to have an atmosphere to a planet in order to have liquid water and the chemistry of life. So if you look at Mars, Mars lost its atmosphere, and therefore no liquid water on the surface anymore. I mean, the rain has been early, and that's what the Perseverance uh, survey, you know, uh, the Perseverance mission is we try to find out whether it had liquid water, whether there was life perhaps on it at the time, but at some point it lost its atmosphere, and then the liquid water would come. So the only reason that we can live on Earth yeah. is because of the atmosphere. But the comet is in vacuum, pretty much. And then when it gets warmed up on the surface, the water becomes, the water ice becomes gas, and then you see this cometary tail behind it. In addition to water, there is uh, there are all kinds of carbon-based molecules of dust that come off the surface and not detectable. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to detect, it's very prominent. You see these cometary tails that look very prominent because they reflect sunlight. And you can see that, in fact, it's sometimes difficult to see the nucleus of the comet because it's surrounded and shrouded with, and in this case, there was no trace of anything. And now, you might say, okay, so that was the community said, okay, but it's not a problem, it's still a rock, you know, it's yeah. not a comet, but it's just a rock, a yeah. bare rock, yeah. it's, you know, okay, no problem. Then, and that's the thing that convinced me to write about it, and then in June 2018, you know, yeah. later, there was a report that, in fact, the object uh, uh, exhibited an excess push in addition to the force of gravity. So the sun acts on it by gravity, but then there was an extra push on this object that was figured out from the orbit that you can trace. And uh, the question was, what is this excess push? So for comets, you get the rocket effect. When you evaporate gas, you know, just like a jet engine on an airplane, you throw a jet engine is very simple. You throw the gas back and it pushes the airplane forward. That's not, that's not a jet. So, in the case of a comet, you throw gas in the direction of the sun because it's, and then you get a push. Okay? So, in the case of comets, you get a push. But the no comets are in there. So, then people say, oh, wait a second. Is it an asteroid? No, but it behaves like a comet, but it doesn't look like a comet. So, what? Well, Forget about it. Business as usual. So that's what they mean by uh, non-gravitational non -gravitation acceleration. So that's interesting. So like the, the primary force acting on something like that, it's a rock or an asteroid, would be if you can predict the trajectory based on the gravity, well, based on gravity. And so here there's detected movement that not cannot be accounted for right. by gravity. And right. before the comet, you would need about a tenth of the mass of this comet, the weight of this comet. To be evaporated in order to give it an earth of size of that. Well, size, 10 percent of the mass evaporating is huge. Think about it, a hundred meter size object losing 10 percent of its mass. You can't miss that. <laughs> and uh, so that's a little weird. It's super weird. Well, it's very good at yeah, so, so, in your mind the of You know, so I operated just like Sherlock Holmes. You know, <laughs> I said, okay, what are the possibilities? And, the only thing I could do, so I ruled out the, everything else, and I, I said it must be the sunlight reflected off it. Okay, so the sunlight reflects off the surface and gives it a push, just like you get a push on a sail on a boat, you know, from the wind reflecting off it. Now, in order for this to be effective, it turns out the object needs to be extremely thin. Uh, it turns out it needs to be less than a millimeter thick. Nature does not produce such things. So, but we produce it because it's called the technology of the light sail. So, we are for space exploration, we are exploring this technology because it, it has the benefit of not needing to carry the fuel with the spacecraft. So, you don't have the fuel, you just have a, 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 you just have a sail, and it's being pushed either by sunlight or by laser beam or whatever. Uh, so, Perhaps this is a light sail. So this is a 
this is actually the same technology as the Starshot project. Yes. So, yeah, so people, said, okay. people afterwards say, okay, you work on this project, you imagine it. You know, no, always, always, your right? always in my imagination is limited by what I know. <laughs> so, yes. I, you know, I would not deny that, you know, working on life skills expanded my ability to imagine this possibility. Yeah. But let me offer another interesting anecdote. In September this year, 2020, yeah. uh, 2020 yeah. um, there was Another object found, and it was given the name 2020 SO by the Minor Planet Center. You know, this is a, an organization actually in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that gives names to objects, astronomical objects found in the solar system. And they gave it that name 2020 SO because you know, it looks like uh, an object in the solar system. And, uh, it moves in an orbit that is similar to the orbit of the Earth. But not the same exactly. And therefore it was bound to the sun. But it also exhibited a deviation from what you expect based on gravity. So they astronomers that found this uh, extrapolated back in time and found that in 1966 it intercepted the Earth. And then they realized went to the history books and they realized, oh, there was a mission called Lunar Surveyor, Lunar Lander, Surveyor 2 that uh, had a rocket booster, it was a failed mission, but uh, there was a rocket booster that was kicked into space. And presumably this is the rocket booster that we're seeing. Now, this rocket booster was sufficiently hollow and thin for us to recognize that it's pushed by planets. So here is my point. We can tell from the orbit of an object, obviously this object didn't have any cometary space. It was artificially made. We know that it was made by us. And it did deviate from an orbit of a rock. Yeah. So just by seeing something that doesn't have cometary tail and deviates from an orbit shaped by gravity, we can tell that it's artificial. In the case of Oumuamua, it couldn't have been sent by humans because it just passed near us for a few months. We know exactly what we were doing at those times at that time. And also it was moving faster than any object that we can launch. And so obviously it came from outside the solar system. And the question is, he produced it. Now, I should say that you know, when I walk off on, on vacation on the beach, I often see natural objects that seashells that are beautiful, and I look, look at them. And, um, and every now and then, I stumble on a plastic bottle, and so the product is usually produced. And my point is that maybe a more more was a message in a bottle, and uh, we should think this is simply another window into searching. So artifacts from other situations. Where do you think it could have come from? And if it's so okay. From a scientific perspective, the narrow minded view as we'll probably talk about throughout is, you know, you kind of want to stick to the things that uh, the naturally originating objects like that's where the comment. Okay, that's the state of possible hypothesis. And then if we expand beyond that you start to think, okay, these are artificially constructed, like you just said, it could be by humans. It could be by, uh, by something, whatever that means, by some kind of extraterrestrial alien civilization. If, if it's the alien civilization variety, what is this object then? That will look at. An excellent question. And let me lay out, I mean, we don't have enough evidence to tell. Now, we had a photograph, perhaps, which had more information. But there, was, there is one other peculiar fact about Oumuamua. Uh, well, other than it was very shiny, as I didn't mention, uh, you know, we didn't detect any heat from it, and that implies that it's rather small and shiny. Uh, but the other peculiar fact is that it, was, it came from a very special frame of reference. So it's sort of like finding a car in a parking lot, in a public parking lot, that you know, you can't really tell where it came from. Uh, so there is this frame of reference where you average over the motions of all the stars in the neighborhood of the sun. So um, you find the so-called local standard of rest of the galaxy, and that's uh, a frame of reference that is obtained by averaging the random motions of all the stars, and the sun is moving relatively to that frame at some speed. Uh, but this object was addressed in that frame, 
And only one in 500 stars is so much address in the frame. And that's why I was saying it's like a parking lot. It was parked there. Yeah. And we bumped into it. So the relative speed between the solar system and this object, <laughs> we are moving. And it was sitting still. Now you have to say, why is it so unusual in that context? Yeah. You know why? Because if it was expelled from another planetary system, most likely it will carry the speed of the of star that it came from. Because it was you know, the most loosely bound objects are in the periphery of the planetary system and they move very slowly relative to the star and so they carry the when they are ripped apart from the planetary system, most of the objects will have the residual motion of the star, right? Relative to the rocket star. But this one was a present of it. Now, one thing I can think of is if there is a grid of a uh, hole, you know, like for navigation systems, so that you can find your way in the local frame, yeah. then that would be one of the reasons why it's a little expensive of the static grid, but there could be another study with really great grid. Uh, evenly, in some definition, evenly spread out, spread out of the objects like these, right. they're just out there. And lot of them, another possibility is that the are relay stations, you know, that for communication, you might think in order to communicate with a huge beacon, yeah. a very powerful beacon, but it's not true because even on Earth, you know, we have these relay stations, so you have a not so powerful beacon, so it can be carried only out to a limited distance, but then you relay the message, yeah. and it could be one of those. Now, after it collided with the, the solar system, of course, it got a kick, so it's just like a, a video for, you know, we get it, a, a kick by colliding with but most of them are not colliding with stars. So that's one point. Okay? Yeah. And there should be new lots of them, if that's the case. Um, and the other possibility is that it's a probe, you know, that was sent uh, in the direction of the um, uh, habitable region around the sun to find out if there is life. Now, it takes tens of thousands of years for such a probe to traverse the solar system from the outer edge of the Oort cloud all the way to where we are. And then you went a long journey. So when it started the journey from the edge of the solar system to get to us now, you know, we were rather primitive back then. You know, we we still the inherent technology there was no reason to be you know there was grass around and so forth. But you know maybe it is a problem. Uh so you said ten thousand years. That that's so it takes that long. Tens of thousands, yes, yeah, tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the other thing I should say is, you know, it could be just a, a, an outer layer of something else, like, you know, something that was ripped apart, like a, a surface of an instrument that was, and, and you can have lots of these pieces, you know, something great, lots of these pieces spread out, like space junk, and, you know, that's a bit of space junk from an actress and from an alien elevation. Yes. So it is. I can yeah. tell you about space junk. Okay, let, let me just yeah. what do you mean by space junk? So uh, I think uh, you know, you, you might ask, why aren't they looking for us? One possibility is that we are not interested, like we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. another possibility, you know, if there are millions of or billions of years uh, into their technological development, they created their own their own uh, habitat, their own cocoon. Where they feel comfortable, they have everything they need, and it, it, it's risky for them to establish communication with other. Uh, so they have their own cocoon and they close off. And they don't care about anything else. Now, in that case, you might say, oh, so how can we find about them if they are closed off? The answer is they still have to deposit trash, right? That, that is something from the law of thermodynamics. There must be some production of trash. And, you know, we can still find about them, just like investigative journalists going through the trash cans of yeah. uh, celebrities in Hollywood, you know. You can learn about the private lives of those celebrities by looking at them. It's fascinating to think, you know, if we're the ants in this picture, if we, if this thing is a water bottle, or if it's like a smartphone, like where, where on the spectrum of possible objects of space, because there's a lot of interesting trash. <laughs> <laughs> so like, where, how interesting is this trash? Well, imagine a caveman seeing a cell phone. So yeah. a caveman would think, since the caveman played with rock all of his life, he would say, it's a rock. Just like my 
set off from a Mercedes. Right, exactly. It's been brilliantly put. And he has signed his deal to Waterbio or a smartphone. Because it's not, I, I hope it's even more than a smartphone. I hope that it's something that is really sophisticated and like, yeah, see, I'm the opposite. I, I feel like I hope it's a water bottle because at least we have a hope with our current that feels to understand it. Yeah, a caveman has no way of understanding the smartphone. It's like it will be. Like, I feel like a caveman has more to learn from the plastic water bottle than they do from the smartphone. But suppose we figure it out, if we, if we 